Good morning, you guys. How are you guys doing today? How is doing? Good. Does everybody have their power on? Everybody's got, anybody have their not have power yet? Everybody's got their power on. Boy, that's something to be thankful for. Right? And uh, because right now, obviously, uh, Puerto Rico, they're dealing with the aftermath, and uh, Mexico's going through earthquakes. I don't know if you guys, you get, anybody else have natural disaster fatigue? Like, it's just like overwhelming. Um, and, uh, and yet in the midst of all of this, this is so important. You know, there's an opportunity for us to make a difference. The fact is, is we know God is our, is our, is our source of abundance. We know God is our provider. And, uh, and we are praying, just so you know, about our response to what's going on in Puerto Rico. So we're doing some research, getting some background. We want to make sure that whatever we do, it's going to bring maximum impact and it's going to really make a difference because that's why God created us, right? To make a difference. And uh, so we are praying about that um, right now. And, uh, and by the way, last week I gave a challenge to you guys and I said, hey, go to the store, get non-perishable food items uh, to get, get a lot of it, enough for yourself and your family and enough for the food bank. Um, give that part to the food bank, hang on to the part for yourself, and then in November we'll be able to bless them again because they're going to get depleted. And see, here's the deal. Food bank, uh, the shelves have been wiped out because of Hurricane Irma and that. And so an important part of our role in the community is to make a difference by uh, being a part of the generosity that gets expressed. So uh, thank you. A lot of you actually responded to that. We've had a, a lot of food that has been brought in all week long. Let me encourage you, keep it up. Uh, we can never give too much in that regard. So... Thank you. So let's take a moment, you guys, and before we jump into the message, uh, let's lift up those that are dealing, still dealing with some of those, the fallout, and, uh, and let's just pray. Father, thank you that, Lord, first of all, we have so much to be thankful for. God, we had crews down here, and they were getting power hooked up, and people from out of state coming here, and, and Lord, just so many things, we just get back on our feet so quickly, and Lord, there, there are those that, that, like in Puerto Rico and Mexico, they don't get on their feet as quickly. They don't have the access to resources the way that we do. And, and, and Lord, we thank you, God, that uh, you are enabling us and calling us to be a part of what is right in this world and the opportunity to make a difference. We lift up the people of Puerto Rico to you, Lord. And we ask, God, that you would tap into that resilient spirit that you've already given them. Lord, that you would make yourself known, that you would bring hope, that you would bring love and compassion, Lord, in ways that are just unprecedented. And Lord, that the people of Puerto Rico would be lifted up by those that care from the outside that are a part of their recovery. And pray the same for Mexico, Lord, that you would do that for them as well. And Lord, that in all these things, we thank you, that we always have a source of strength in you. And God, that we can make a difference, that we can engage in ways that matter both here in our community and uh, uh, outside of our own borders of this continent. God, thank you for that. And Lord, we ask that you continue to glorify yourself, continue to move on our hearts, continue to, to pour into us everything that you want us to express to the world around us. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, your power, your Holy Spirit living in us, your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Um, and so uh, a few weeks ago, we started this series called Legacy. And this is so important to think about because for a lot of people, they don't think about their destiny and they don't think about their legacy. They just kind of go through life and kind of at the end look back on something that maybe you intended to leave behind and maybe you didn't intend to leave behind. But the fact is, is you're, build, you're leaving a legacy and you're building a legacy right now. I don't know if you thought about it, but you're actually building a legacy right now. And, and there's a, 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 an invitation from God to step into creating the, uh, your destiny with him. A destiny is not just this inevitability that is going to happen to you. You get to create the future with God. We literally get to be a part of that. And, and rather than kind of wander through life and then look back and go, oh, that's what I left behind. Instead, you can work now on what it is that you want to leave behind. 
And if you're going to do that successfully, if I'm going to do that successfully, one of the key elements of that is to be able to, to learn how to manage this, this gap between the generations. And this generation gap, as we call it, is nothing new. I mean, people have been like saying, what is up with young people today? Forever. Really, it's not like something that just happened with millennials. This is something that if you go and you read literature far back, you'll find that there was always a tension between those that were farther along in life, looking at those, especially those who were in their early adult years and going, I don't get them. What is up with that? And the problem is, is that if you don't learn how to bridge that effectively and successfully, you actually will miss out on one of the most important things that your destiny calls for. And that's how to bridge that gap and to pass something on in a way that is so important. Listen, in every generation, not just in the church world, but look at the, uh, the corporate world, okay? Innovation is so important. And years ago in our day, IBM, Big Blue, they were, the, they were the big innovative guys on the block, right? IBM, they were like, they were it. Like if you could get a job with IBM, you had arrived. But IBM, in their, in their goal to kind of bring computing to the world, they, they weren't the ones that, that were the innovators later on. While IBM in their three-piece suits and their pinstripe suits were high-fiving each other in the boardroom of how awesome they were, there was a hippie dude that was going, you know what, every home should have a computer. And ultimately, you should be able to hold it in your hand and put it in your pocket. A guy named Steve Jobs that went, there's something that could be done that is so much better than the way things are. And one of the things that we see in the corporate world, and it's the same in life, is this, is that the next innovation does not come from the previous generation. It comes from this generation. And that every generation has to experience its moment where creativity and innovation can happen, and it's not going to come from those that have come before them. But those that have come before them do play a role. And this morning I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the role that you and I play, both in the older generation and the younger generation. And I'm not going to name a year of where that line is, okay? You won't have to worry about that. But this isn't anything new. This is a, 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 a difficulty and a problem that has been going on for a long time. And we see that even in Scripture, in the history of Israel, 586 B.C. is when, is when the nation was carried off into captivity and brought into Babylon. We call that the Babylonian exile. Leading up to that had been a whole different life where there was the temple and there was worship and there were businesses and there was social interaction and all that stuff. And all that went away because of idolatry. God brought them into Babylonian captivity. As we learned last week, it was for 70 years. And after that 70 years, God now brought them back into the land. And in that 70-year period of time, people that had come out of what it was like before the exile, many of them died, but people that were 10, 20 years old, lived in exile, they were coming out of it as old people, but they remembered very well what life used to be like, what it was like in the good old days. And now here they are back in the land and the foundation of the temple is being laid. Now there's a fresh move of God in their midst. And let's take a look at what happens as they lay that foundation. In Ezra chapter 3, it says, when, when the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals. These were the musical uh, group of the priests. They clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. Look at verse 12. But many of the older priests, older Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple 
wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. You see the picture? So you, you've got a picture of, 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 of the laying of the foundation. And people are going, man, God is so good. God is so Faithful. God is doing a thing in our generation, but you've got an older generation who had seen things uh, in the temple, had been a part of something earlier, that were unable to enjoy what God was doing in the current generation. Because they were busy grieving what wasn't anymore. They were too busy grieving what they lost. They were too busy thinking about the good old days to be able to, to celebrate what God was doing in the new day. See, this is our story. And this is the difficulty that the generations have. This is the, the, the difficulty that, and the tension that we experience. And if you're going to leave a legacy, if you're going to pass something on, then you have got to learn how to maneuver through this and how to bridge this gap. Whether you're young, you play a part, or whether you're old, you play a part. Everybody plays a part in this. And we're going to talk about that today. And so for the older generation, I've got a word for you. One word and one word only. And it's the word invest. Your role is to invest in the younger generation. Your role is to see what is happening with the younger generation, and even though you don't understand it, and even though you don't relate to it, and even though it's not like the way things used to be, that you're able to celebrate it. Because more than anything, you're excited that God is doing something in a younger generation, because every generation needs its own move of God. See, sometimes it's hard to do. Because when things change, it gets a little scary, doesn't it? When things change, you wonder, oh my goodness, what's happening to this world? Right? And see, let me tell you something. The issue has never been age. The generation gap, the issue has never been age. You know what the real issue is? Who's in control? That's the issue. And when your generation begins to feel like you don't have control anymore, it becomes threatening. And see, so what happens is you have to be able to celebrate what you're not controlling. You have to be able to celebrate what God is bringing and the innovations that are coming through another generation of people. You have to be able to go, hey, I may not relate to it. It may not click with me, but, but I can celebrate it. And, and you know, it's, it's not enough to just sit back and to, and to kind of criticize and look at young people and go, what is up with millennials? Holy smokes, what is up with them and their phones? You want to you know who has the biggest addiction with phones? It's actually not young people. It's older people. Because we're the ones going, oh, look, Facebook. Look, I can watch videos. What? This is amazing. Has anybody seen these? And see, the young people go, oh, yeah, Instagram, blah, blah. Okay, they put it away. They're good. Right? We're the ones that are staring at it. And, and, and you can't sit back and just go, well, I don't, I don't approve. It's not like the way I was raised. You've got to be able to instead take the things that you've learned because what, you, what lives in you is so valuable. You can't just lament what you're losing. Take a look at what Scripture says. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I love this. It says, do not say, why were the old days better than these? Don't say, Whatever happened to the good old days? Don't say, how come they don't do it like we used to do it? What does it say? For it is not wise to ask such questions. It's not productive to ask questions like that. Questions like that keep you grieving what you've lost and missing out on the opportunity to celebrate a new thing that is happening in your midst that you may not understand, and you may not connect to, but you've got to be able to say, man, you know something? I'm so glad. You guys, the foundation is being laid. The best is yet to come. That's what I want to see. That's the way I'm going to be. And you've got to invest. Take a look at what it says in Titus chapter 2. 
It says, These, the older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. The, the older women, hey, have you learned how to balance career and family? Man, there's some ladies that are still trying to figure it out. Have you been able to like build a family and have a strong family unit in this world? Wow, there are some young ladies that really could use your wisdom. What are you doing to invest? What are you doing to take the skills that you've learned? Listen, people, before one year of marriage is up, they already think, I married the wrong person, I need to bail. No. Some of you have worked through so much stuff in your marriage that you look at that and you go, I don't get that. Don't stand back and do that, but instead invest. Help people to understand, no, this is a part of marriage. It's a part of the process. You're going to learn. Hang in there. Let me help you to understand how all of that works. He goes on to say this to the men. In the same way, encourage the young men to live what? Wisely. Wisely means skillfully. That's what wisely means. It means don't be accidental about how you do life. Be strategic, be intentional, think about the decisions you're making. It says, encourage the young men to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Show the younger generation what it looks like to make a difference. Engage. They need to see that you don't just get old and rot. They need to see that you can make a difference now. And, he, and here's the deal. Listen. So who's the older generation? The older generation is everybody above 53 years of age. <laughs> so those of you that are above 53, in October it changes. It's everything above 54 at that point. <laughs> there is so much that we have to offer. And here's a, here's a cool thing. You don't actually have to wait till you're in your 50s. Here's the truth. You could be in your 20s and mentor somebody. All you have to do is just be a little bit farther and have worked through some stuff. And when you mentor somebody in your 20s and you mentor them in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, you are now intentionally leaving a legacy. You are taking the things that you have learned and now you're passing them on things that the younger generation needs. Now, here's the deal. You may have, like, grown a business, and you understand business principles. And, and look, yes, business has changed. It's not brick-and-mortar stores anymore. It's Internet now. It's home-based. There's so, so many different innovations. But the principles of how you do business don't change. And there are things that you've learned in your years of experience of how to run a business well, that for young families that are just starting out running a business, you have so much to offer if you take time to invest. And as young people are beginning to spread their wings, when people like this, this is what I love about small groups. Small groups is about creating environments where this sort of thing can happen. All of our groups are intergenerational, except for some that are just generational. But we have an intergenerational component in all of our groups where people can get together and it's about being able to invest in other people the wisdom that you have learned as you've lived life. And in these passages in Titus, here's what he's saying. He's saying, be intentional about this. Like, you should literally be able to look at your schedule and say, this is where I'm investing in a person. This is where I'm passing things on. This is where I'm taking what I have learned and I'm investing in the next generation. You should have that in your schedule. Titus, he said, Titus, have the, have, let this happen. You yourself must be an example. Encourage young men to live wisely. Help the older women. Have the wi older women train the younger women. Everybody should be intentional about leaving a legacy and about stepping into and creating the future together. And so this happens in all of our small groups. So that is the place where it can really, really take place. And by the way, some of our small groups, like this is like the most creative bunch. You guys blow me away. So like we've got a group for uh, young leaders who want to learn leadership principles. Excuse me, it's for anybody who wants to learn leadership principles. That happens Monday night right here. Paul White uh, leads that. We have a cornhole small group, you guys. 
How could that be a bad thing, right? It's cornhole. Anybody not know what cornhole is? Cornhole is a game. It's a game. You play in the air. You know what it is? Hey, it's this generation's version of lawn darts without the points, okay? That's what this is. But it's not just about cornhole. We've got groups that are doing beach walking. We've got women's groups. We've got men's groups. All those, listen, we get together for any reason. Why? Because we're creating environments where we can invest in one another. And where we can make sure that we're actually building the kind of legacy that we can look back on and say, that's what I was created for. I love this. Psalm 71, verse 18. It says, now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Don't sideline me. Don't, like, just retire me. Don't do that. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. Listen, for those of you that have walked with God for a long time, are you sharing the things that God has done in your life and the things that you've seen God do? Are you sharing that with the younger generation? Are you expanding their faith? Are you pouring into them in a way that they're seeing God as big the way that you see God? See, there's always something to invest, always something to pass on. So who, in whom are you investing? You should be able to look at your schedule and be able to say, here's when it's happening, here's where it's happening. So the word for the older generation is invest. For the younger generation, everyone 53 and under, here's what your word is. Honor. Your role is to honor. It's to understand that the older generation might not understand how to work their cell phone. They may not know how to work their computer. They may seem really out of date and antiquated and irrelevant. But I guarantee you, the world that you live in today where innovation can happen and where your generation can thrive is happening because of those that have gone before you. And you and I stand upon the shoulders of everyone that has gone before us. Every innovation, even though it happens within that generation, happens because some innovator went ahead of you and they took the arrows for you, they took the criticism for you, they took all the risks, and they laid a foundation that you're able to stand on and create what God is putting in you to create. And, and, and we, have to, we have to understand that when you look around this room and you may look at people and go, yeah, they're probably a little bit out of it. They can tell you of friends that have given up their lives to give the freedom that we enjoy. To be able to have the kind of place where you can innovate and where you can create and where you can experience this. And we owe it to those that have gone before us and to those that are older than us. We owe it to honor them and to consider them to be weighty and to understand that even though there are things technologically that have changed, there is wisdom that we can gain from learning to honor and value those that have gone before us. First Timothy chapter 5 says, Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. And that assumes that you're respectful to your father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother. That assumes that you treat your mother with respect and love. And treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sister. Say, honor them. Value them. Because, listen, any innovations that happen Anything that is created, we stand on the shoulders of people that have gone before us. And it's so strange because, you know, you get these things that happen not only in the outside world, but in, in church world too. You know that one of the most controversial things at one time was when churches started using an overhead projector to put the lyrics on a screen? We never did it that way before. We have hymnals. We're not going to abandon hymnals, are we? And people are like putting lyrics up. Can you believe that that was actually a controversy? Can you believe that people used to argue over stuff like that? And see, but we have to understand that that was meaningful to somebody. And now there's something new that's meaningful. And churches have to innovate. And, and companies have to innovate. Years ago, I went to go uh, 
to see, uh, I, went, I was at a conference for pastors at Andy Stanley's church, North Point Community Church. His father, Charles Stanley, some of you may have heard Charles Stanley. He was the, he was the most, he, he was the most uh, important pastor in the formation of my faith. Because he was actually teaching the Bible and talking about the Holy Spirit in a way that I had never heard anybody talk about. And uh, I went to his conference, and Charles Stanley was the closing speaker. And if you know anything about Charles Stanley, he does church completely differently than the way his son Andy does. Charles Stanley is the old school. Andy Stanley is the innovation. And Charles Stanley stood up, and he said, men, let me tell you something. Men and ladies, let me tell you something. He said, the message never changes. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sins that you and I uh, have committed. God forgives. He comes into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will change you from the inside out. You have a relationship with him. He said, the message never changes. He goes, but methods have to change. There has to be innovation because every generation begins to speak in a different way and begins to connect to things that are different. And it is, it, is under, it is important to be able to honor the fact that there are those on whose shoulders we stand at the same time to be able to innovate. One of the greatest moments was when I, when I was able to go up to Charles Stanley and personally shake his hand, look him in the eye and say, thank you. Nobody had a greater impact on the formation of my faith than you did. Thank you. And it was just a great moment. Listen, honor is so important. When you learn to honor the older generation, it actually positions you, as far as God is concerned, to be elevated. You can't gripe about the older people. They just don't get it. They're so cranky. <laughs> and listen, don't think that I don't fight this in traffic. And here's what happens to me. Somebody's going 10 miles an hour below the speed limit. And I get behind them. And I see a gray, I see a gray head of hair. <laughs> and when I see that, I have to back off. And I go, God, forgive me for my anger. If that person was driving beyond their skill to drive, we would be really mad because somebody would die. They're driving within their skill level. And we all want to buy their car when they're ready to get rid of it because it's just, <laughs> so forgive me for that. And I, and I just go, God, that person, I don't know who they are and forgive me for being irritated with them because they have value and they have things that I could learn. And I, and I, and I just need to be open to that. And see, you and I, we need to honor those that have gone before us. We need to show them honor. And sometimes that means that you're going to hold the door open. Something as simple as that. It's just a way of reminding yourself, I value the older generation. It matters. It matters to me. And so, to the older generation, don't resent, fear, or judge the next generation of believers. Invest in them. Pour into them. Because here's the truth. They are not the church of tomorrow. They're actually the church of today. That's the truth. And there's so much that you have to offer them that is going to help them to go farther, faster because of what you pour into them. Don't get messed up with style. Don't worry about all that stuff. Empower them. The best days are ahead if you, can, if you can bless even what you don't understand. Young people, honor the older people. Respect the older people. Check yourself up when you find yourself getting irritated. And understand this, guys. One day, you're going to be old and somebody's going to be behind you in traffic. And so think about that. And here's the, here's the truth. Older people, you get irritated with the, with, the, with, the, with the younger generation. You're like, I just don't get them. I don't understand them. They're so entitled. They're so blah, 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 blah. You go to all this stuff. What were you like when you were 22? Come on. These are things that are just a part of the natural process of growth and maturity. 
to, to drop the judgments. And, 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 and you know, when you look at this, when you look at this passage, wouldn't it be great if like, so we end right there. That's where the chapter ends with the, the mingling of weeping and the mingling of joy. It's all happening at the same time. That's actually the end of that chapter. Wouldn't it be great if we could add some verses to that? You know, wouldn't it be great if we could kind of add an ending to the story? I mean, it would be blasphemy. That wouldn't be cool. But if we could, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? They lay the foundation. There's the sound of weeping, but there's a sound of incredible celebration. And at a certain point, the older people set it aside and walk up to a young couple and go, man, I am so excited about what God is doing in your generation. I am so happy to see a new thing happening today. I may not understand it. I may not, it may not be all that I was, is meaningful to me, may not be as meaningful to what I experienced, but man, here's what I can relate to. Every generation needs its own move of God, and I'm so glad God is doing it with you guys. Because the best is yet to come. And wouldn't it be great if a young couple, in hearing that, would say, thank you. Man, you lost so much. You gave up so much. But you just being here with us matters so much because there are, there are things that, that you experience that I could learn from. And the best is, can, can be yet to come if you teach us. If you teach us. If you invest in us. Would you do that? Wouldn't it be great if those verses were there? Wouldn't it be great if young people said, hey, we're here laying this foundation, but we stand on your shoulders. You already know how to build the temple. We're not inventing this. This is something that you already knew how to do, so we're happy to learn from you. Wouldn't it be great if that happened? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be great if there was just this coming together and, and it, instead of being a mixture of weeping and joy, the weeping got quieter and quieter and the joy got louder and louder. Wouldn't it be great if we could write that? Well, we can. You see, that's, that's what God is offering. You see, you and I, we get to write the story in this generation. You and I get to take our place within what God is doing in our world today. You and I have this place where, where we have been a part of things that are so meaningful, but we've got to bless what God is doing in the new generation. You may not relate to it. You may not identify with it, but you can identify with what it is like to experience God moving in your generation so you can be happy for them and theirs. We get to write that story. We get to have a place where young people can innovate and young people can try some things and young people can, can have their own experiences of God knowing that there are people all around them who've been walking with God for a long time that are able to say, I am so excited for you and what God is doing in your generation. I bless it. I may not understand it, but I celebrate it because I just love the fact that God is so faithful and I love what he's doing. And so this is so important for us, you guys. This is a part of you leaving a legacy. It's part of me leaving, leaving a legacy too. And listen, this is important. We need your prayers because we're gonna be adding some staff. We're gonna be like going through a process of interviewing. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna look for some young people. I'm gonna look for some young people. Why? Because old people aren't important? No. Because old people should be investing in young people. And we should be the ones cheering them on and celebrating what God is going to do through them that's going to be different than what God has done through us. Because every generation needs its own move of God. And that's who we are. And that's why we do things like small groups so we can get generations together. And this just becomes a part of the fabric of who we are. So make sure that you step into a place and a position where you're investing, where you're honoring, where you're teachable, where you're passing things on, where you're experiencing the energy of young people and enjoying the innovation of young people and where young people can celebrate the fact that they stand upon your shoulders and that you've been through some stuff and you've created a place where that can happen. 
And so that's, that's what we're doing. And that's what God wants us to do. And so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you would. And I just want to call on God as together. We say, God, this is the moment that we step into. This is the environment that we create. This is what we believe, God. That we are called to invest. That this is a place where honor happens. And God, where you do your finest work because we have chosen to bridge the gap between the generations. And so, Lord, may you pass on the strength, the wisdom, the intentional living. May you pass on, Lord, all of the things that you want to pass on that the younger generation can stand upon and build upon, something that lasts. And Lord, may you bring such honor that the younger are able to celebrate the older, learn, be encouraged, and bring energy and a new way of seeing things. Thank you, God. And with your eyes still closed, one of the greatest things that Jesus wants to pass on to you is the knowledge that you are forgiven and the knowledge that you are loved by God. And maybe you thought that you couldn't be a part of something like that, that if God knew everything you've ever done, there's no way he could forgive you. Well, here's the good news. He knows everything you've ever done. And he delights in forgiving you. And so if you want to know that your sins are forgiven and you want to enter into a relationship with him, then right where you are, you can just, you can invite him into your life. You can say, Lord, I know that I've sinned and I know that you paid for those sins. And on the basis of what you've done, I turn away from my sin and I turn to you. I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to come into my life and change me from the inside out by the power of your spirit. From this day forward, God, my life is yours. And I want you to build a legacy that I can look back on and know that was the life that you created me to live. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the relationships we have here. Thank you for the intergenerational nature of our assembly, our church, this community. God, I pray that you just do beautiful things through these groups, that you do beautiful things in our midst through the things that we do, investing and honoring. May you be honored and delighted in all of it. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let's give it up for God, you guys.